Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Equip Night on Marriage. We're so glad that you all have decided to come tonight. Uh, I would say this, we said this at the parenting night, that as we sort of planned out our fall and we always have events and community groups and Sundays, we really didn't wanna just add other events to our schedule. What we really wanted to do was equip you and encourage you right where you are. And we picked relationships because I think over the last year and a half, if, as I've met with people, as I've talked with a lot of you, uh, in a pandemic uh, with COVID, I mean, COVID has killed people, but it's also killed a lot more relationships. Uh, it's hurt our, our families, our parents, our spouses, and friendships. And we just thought, man, we really need to take this fall to really press into this and meet people where they are with the truth of the gospel, talk about experiences, get nitty gritty, which we're gonna do tonight uh, as we have our panel a little bit later on. And so, man, that's why we're here. So thanks for making the decision to come. Even those of you who I know aren't married yet, there's a few of you here, this is a great decision. The more you can prep, the less pain you'll experience. And so great decision for those who are married, man, you're already winning in marriage right now just because you came and ate some Greek food. You didn't know how, how well you were doing already. Um, so, man, I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, we're going to have our guest speakers, Don and Renee, come up in, in just a moment. I want to pray for them as well. Uh, and then we're going to have a panel at the end where we'll, re we'll address questions. And so that's kind of what the night will look like. Continue eating. And we're so glad you're here. Let me pray. God, thanks so much uh, for marriage. Thank you so much for designing marriage, but also uh, putting yourself on display through marriage that marriage is such a bigger picture than just what's going on between a spouse and a spouse. It's what's going on between a spouse and a spouse and a savior. God, that you sent your son Jesus into the world to redeem everything that was broken by sin, including marriage. And God, I just pray tonight for these men and women that are here, that God, they would have softened hearts, sharpened minds as they got off work and maybe even got in a fight coming here. God, you would just meet them right where you are with your truth and your grace, and you would change us. You would change our marriages for your glory and our joy. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray that, and everybody said... Amen. Hey, we have the privilege tonight of having some amazing guest speakers, Donna Renee Wooster. Uh, my wife and I have been to one of their marriage retreats. We've sent people in our church to their marriage retreats. This is what they do. This is what they love, they're passionate about. Uh, it's authentic, it's what they pursue in their own marriage, but also what they help other people pursue in the church, which is really unique. And so they're gonna share from their life, from their experience, from God's word. And so would you welcome up Donna Renee with me? Would you give them a PBC welcome? Thank you. Uh, I love a good introduction. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. And um, we'll be here every week. We had no idea this was available. And just, <laughs> such a great Food, church. Tables. Just come so good. <laughs> Um, we are grateful to, that you would come out on a Monday night, and um, we have four kids. Um, just this last month, they all, they all returned during COVID, and they all moved out uh, this last month, and um, our daughter graduated from high school this last year, so it's our first new season of um, no children in our home. And uh, so we have two boys, Keaton and then Jacob and then Emma and then Abigail. And they go from um, age 30 all the way down to age 18. And Emma, who is 22, when um, she was in kindergarten because once you have your kids in school, then I was the mom who was standing there and all the moms were all lined up, sending them into the kindergarten room and all the moms were waving and I was waving too. And I go, have so much fun. <laughs> And I was like, thank God, she's going to kindergarten. And then I turn and I look and all the other moms are crying. And I, and I go, oh, is this a crying thing? I didn't know it was a crying thing, right? But kindergarten like brings out all these, all these things, you know, the conversations come home, they're now being exposed and getting this place of teaching and education and making friends and all the goodness, right? So our daughter came home and it always driving time, you get the lowdown of what happened at school that day. So talking to, uh, 
Emma, as we're driving home, and I go, tell me about what happened. And she goes, I have some big news about what happened today during recess, which is always the big news of what happens during recess really matters. And she said, during the lunch hour, um, all the girls sit at one table and all the boys sit at another table. And she goes, mom, I was sitting at the girl table. And then this boy, Luke, came over and he made his way over to the girl table. And all the girls screamed. And then all the boys went, what are you doing? And they yelled at Luke, and then he couldn't stop himself, and he said, I love Emma! <laughs> and I go, wow. He just let everyone know, and she goes, yes, let everyone know. And I go, she goes, but, you know, she goes, it's okay, Mom. And I go, okay, well, let's keep talking about, you know, what's, what's happening during, during school. And so when Dawn got home, I said, hey, uh, you might want to go in and, and it was like queuing up Dawn to having the conversation. And I said, hey, you might want to go in and have a conversation with Emma about what happened at recess today. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm coming home and I've just been, I'm doing my postdoctoral training and I've had a full day. But Renee tells me they've had this little incident, you know, between Luke and her and the, there's chaos, you know, in the, in the, uh, li not in the library, but in the lunchroom. So I thought, I'll, I'll just deposit a little. I'll just make sure she's okay. So I, I say, I go, Emma, so mom told me about what happened today. And she goes, yeah, dad. She goes, we've talked. We're just going to be friends. <laughs> and, uh, I said, oh, okay. Well, Hey, that's great. And then I thought, I'll just make a little deposit here. And I go, you know, someday Emma, there may be some boy who comes into your life and he may really want to be with you. And I go, if some boy is going to be with you, maybe even marry you, you know what? Here's the thing. That boy has to love you more than anyone if he's really going to marry you. Do you understand? And she looked and she goes, um, actually, Dad, I, th I think he needs to love Jesus a little more than me. Right? That's right. I was testing you. <laughs> I was testing you, Emma. Um, right? I mean, here's my sweet little six-year-old daughter in this really pure way who's kind of come to this conclusion. She goes, you know what? If the person I'm with loves Jesus more than me, I'll be fine. I'll be fine, because because Emma would go, I know Jesus loves me, so if you love him, you'll you'll do fine loving me. <laughs> um, but I think even at even at six, there was some uh, the wisdom of a child to realize that if um, if we just show up with this love or infatuation or intensity with each other, but without something greater than that, mm -hmm. uh, over time and circumstance, we may really run out. I think I'm getting a different microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, can we give it up for that handoff? That was beautiful. Okay. Uh, does that make sense, right? That the, uh, the foundation actually becomes something that's not about us. Yeah. It's something that comes before us and beyond us. There's a lot of bad advice out there and a lot of good advice out there. And so to start our time, we would love for you to have a little discussion about some advice that you've heard about marriage, okay? So the discussion question is one piece of advice that you've heard about marriage, good or bad, okay? So go ahead and have that conversation around your table. Good or bad, it can be good or bad, some advice you've heard about marriage. Okay, so you have a chance to talk about the good or bad advice that's happened. Um, hey, could you could you shout it out? Tell us some advice that you heard that uh, that you've heard that's good or bad. Particularly good or particularly bad. Yeah, tell us good or bad advice They're that you've both, heard. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Why often was that the first marriage was the warm up for the second marriage? Oh. First marriage is the warm-up for second the second marriage. marriage. Yeah, that's definitely okay, falling in the... Write that down, go home yeah. and burn it. <clears throat> yes, that's good. Yeah. That's a good, bad advice. Yeah, warm-up. Yeah. This is a practice marriage. Okay, okay. What, else is, what else is out there? Good or bad advice? You should have a PhD in your spouse. You should have a PhD in your spouse. Yeah. 
I like that one. PhD and your spouse, like you should know them that well? Yeah, that's good advice. Okay. Anyone else? Good or bad advice? Never go to bed angry. Never go to bed angry. We put that as bad advice. It is bad advice. It is bad, bad advice. Bad. It is bad advice. It's used in a really wrong way. Yeah. Name of Jesus against that advice. <laughs> You're tired. Go to bed. <laughs> go to bed. You're not going to fight well. Yeah, get some sleep. Yeah. Okay. What else? Anyone else? Good or bad advice? Someone from the one of the back tables. I haven't heard from back there. There you go. I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Like you shouldn't be sharing toothpaste? You don't. Just avoid it. Just avoid it. That might be the takeaway from the whole night. Right there. <laughs> <clears throat> why, okay. are, why are we talking? Two tubes of toothpaste. Okay. One more. Anyone else? Good or bad advice? Communications number one. Communications number one. Yeah. Well, we could do a whole seminar on that whole thing, but... Because it's kind of funny how communication becomes the thing that people think that it's about, but... Well, it kind of like... Renee will... So, I'll, <laughs> communication means everything and nothing. Yeah. So if somebody comes in and go, oh, you know, I would say, we're having communication problems. You know, it turns out he's robbed three banks and killed a dog <laughs> and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah, he told me communication problems. She goes, well, they're outstanding felonies. And... <laughs> It's a communication problem. I have no idea what that means, right. but it's, yeah. it's a communication yeah. problem. Yeah. Anyone else? We have one more. The grass is greener where you water it. Grass is greener where you water it. Boom. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Mic drop. <laughs> water the grass. Two water tubes the grass. Of toothpaste. Especially right now when you're trying to put in winter grass. Yes. Yes. That's true. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, um, like, there is so much advice floating around out there, um, friends, family, church, that are kind of pumping it out. And so um, tonight, what we want to kind of drop into is, um, on a practical basis, some, some of the nuts and the bolts about how do, we, how do we agree with what God says about marriage? How, how do we be influenced? How do we get in line with that? Um, and so uh, we're thinking about kind of the nuts and the bolts of that. We had, when Renee and I were first married, it's back in 1995, we were up in Flagstaff. <laughs> I was in graduate school at the time. We had no money. We were living real tight, real creatively. And about 8 o'clock at night, there's a knock on the door. She's upstairs. Maybe it was later. You'd gone to bed. Yeah. And this guy knocks on the door, and it turns out that in 1995 that they were doing this um, um, kind of survey across the United States and they were picking 500 people who they would invite into one location in Austin, Texas to be a representative sample of the 290 million people in the United States. So um, they knocked on our door. And, and this guy initially explains, I think he's selling something and then he starts talking to me about what he's doing. And then he comes in and he gives me the whole deal and he goes, hey, we need to get 500 people, and you've been selected because it's this whole random process. We need you to come to Austin, Texas. We'll pay for your flights. We're going to host you all week. Uh, we're going to invite all the national press there. We're going to invite the presidential candidates there. Um, I, was in the, I was in a graduate program. They go, we'll write your president to make sure that your time away is covered. It's this long list. And I am just going, I can't believe this. This is crazy. So I go up, and Renee's... You know, she's gone to bed or she's going to bed. And I go, Renee, you won't believe this. We got picked to go on this thing. And she goes, oh, is this like a timeshare thing? And, and well, and I did say, did you have to buy knives or anything? Yeah. Like, what was it? What, goes, what was the guy selling to you? Cutco knives? What was this? I go, no, no, no. No, they're going to fly us to Austin. They're going to put us up in a hotel. And Renee's going, please tell me you did not believe the man. <laughs> right? And, and there's this kind of deal where as I'm describing all of that they're going to do, Renee's shaking. We've only been married a few months, and she's just going, I can't believe he believes this. This is, this is going to end badly for us. And, right, it was so much resource. It was so much support. It was so generous. It was so complete that it was really almost not believable. 
Mm -hmm. um, now, she kind of says, oh, well, let's call, let's follow up. It was all true. They flew us to Austin. They hosted us for the week. They put us up in a hotel. They paid for our meals. Yeah. It was amazing. Can you say it was sponsored by PBS? PBS. And, and University PBS of Texas. was doing this, the, and University of Austin were doing, were hosting it. They spent several million dollars to fly in this representative sample from the United States. And we got picked. And then within us, I got picked as that one of those 500 people. And so it's kind of like winning the lottery. Um, it was interesting in our relationship, though, because I, I kind of go, this is for real. This is true. And just even one person removed for Renee to go, what's the catch? What, what's the deal? There is no deal. It's just this generous offer. And I think when we approach Scripture and we look at our own lives, um, that kind of what God is inviting us into and asking us to believe and trust mm -hmm. and drawing us into, uh, man, there's, there is a part of having to kind of go, can we believe that? Mm -hmm. Can we believe that that's really available? Can we believe that that's being extended to us? And I think that's one of the things as we look at the foundational part uh, of our life, when we think about these three areas of a of kind of the nuts and bolts of faith. What is a foundation of our marriage? Uh, what's, what is it that we're building our marriage on? And the second thing is, what are the walls? Uh, the walls keep some things out, and then they also allow some things in through doors and windows. And then the third, what's the covering? Um, if we're gonna build a life together, um, we, have, we should have clarity about the, what we're building on. Um, we should have clarity about what is uh, what we're putting on that foundation by ways of access and influence and what's the covering. And so we just want to pop into those three ideas with you and have a little uh, reflection on that. Yeah, the truth is when the Lord says that he's up to good inside of marriage, he talks about this whole concept of oneness. He talks about it in terms of he and the Father are one, right? The Trinity is one. And then he uses that same term for relationship inside of marriage. And he, he brings us into this unitive place. He says, I'm bringing you into the thing that I've already created. We're invited into a unity that's already happened, a relationship that's already existing. And the Lord's showing us what oneness looks like between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's this oneness that he's bringing to us that can feel sometimes like it's an abstract thought inside of marriage, inside of relationship. But it's that kind of goodness. He goes, I want you to understand the oneness that I have with the Father. It's available to you too. So some of the not believing it is experientially inside of relationship, most of us have a lot of scars. Most of us have not very good role models or bad advice about relationships and marriage. And that's what we bring into. So when the Lord's introducing this whole idea of marriage and that it's good and plenty and there's lots behind it and available to us, it's hard to understand. Yeah. But there's this foundation that the Lord brings to us that he goes, the foundation is this oneness, yeah. this place of knowing my love and the completeness in that of understanding that I'm up to a good thing inside of your relationship. And if we don't have models, if we have bad advice, it's hard to imagine that that can be true. A lot of times we have couples that come in and we do some premarital with um, couples and they'll come in and they're believers and we'll, we'll sit down and we'll go, well, tell us about how it's go, you know, like what you're up to and tell us about your relationship. And they go, well, we we're wanting to have a Christian marriage. Mm. Tell me what that means. <laughs> Have you shared Jesus with your marriage? You <laughs> hoping that your marriage comes to Christ? <laughs> Is your marriage considering making a commitment <laughs> to Jesus? <laughs> We'll pray for your marriage. Yeah. <laughs> because really that term is really quite confusing because you go, that's not actually a term to have a Christian marriage. Go, your marriage doesn't have that kind of place. What we want is to have a Christ-centered relationship in our marriage, right? To make Christ the center for us to have oneness with him and with one another. Yeah. And that's really the foundation that we're supposed to start with. That's the place where the Lord cultivates all this goodness. Yeah. 
But it's hard for us to understand because when you even think about, I don't know if you've ever gone to Universal Studios, anyone gone to Universal Studios that's in here? If you go to Universal Studios, you get on one of these little tour buses and then you go behind and you can see they go, this is where this was filmed. And you go, oh my gosh, it looks so different on TV. And you go, yeah, because it's just a cardboard front, right? There's nothing behind it. And that's kind of what the world offers us, right? And a lot of times, even as believers, we're like, we're trying to figure out how do we have that? How do we have this foundation where Christ is the foundation and the oneness with him yeah. and with one another? I think there's a, um, a truth. Uh, uh, scripture says, when you know the truth, the truth will lead us into freedom. And if we're not dealing with truth, if we're not dealing with things that are real, and marriage is a very real relationship, um, if we're kind of picking and choosing or sort of going, I kind of like this idea or this value or this is a practice marriage or whatever else we want to pick up, that's that part of going, yeah, it, it has a certain curb appeal. If you drive by a relationship or you drive, drive those houses in Universal Studios, where I remember our kids wanted to get out and go inside and you go, you know what's behind the door of that house at Universal Studios? Nothing. There isn't a real home in there. It's just curb appeal. And sometimes our culture, the whole emphasis is curb appeal. How do you look? How do you present? Uh, what are you imagining? But marriage is about substance. And it's mm -hmm. about making our home in Christ and letting him make his home in us. Mm -hmm. And that's a very real day-to-day -day lived experience. That, that's not a, a drive-by. That's a lived-in experience that Christ goes, would you let me make my home in you and would you make your home in us the mm -hmm. father son holy spirit there's substance in that mm -hmm. we can live in that kind of substance it's kind of interesting in the old testament yeah. um god sort of presented as outside of the community in the tabernacle and there was this declaration of the law and then in the gospels we find that now that outside tent has been incarnated. We go from declaration to incarnation. And Jesus is alongside of us. And then Jesus says, it gets better because I'm going to the Father and my Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to move inside of you. So God goes from outside to alongside to inside. From declaration to incarnation to revelation. God will be talking to us in the present about what he's up to and what he's inviting us into. He keeps drawing in closer and closer and closer. That's good. And we're invited to let that happen in our life together and let that form and shape how he holds us together in that oneness. Yeah. And when you think about that, the Old Testament, New Testament, and then after Christ leaves with the Holy Spirit, you go, there's always this awareness that the Lord is trying to train inside of people from even the outside to alongside to inside. And some of what we're suggesting in this foundational piece is the awareness is what makes Christ the center of our relationship, the foundation of our relationship. We, us becoming aware together of where the Lord is at inside of us, each of us, and inside of our marriage, that's the part that's foundational to relationship. Yeah, there's a, <clears throat> uh, we were somewhere and, and Renee had made the comment. She goes, you know, the fact that two Christians get married does not mean you have a Christ-centered relationship. Um, you can put your um, jobs as the center or foundation of your relationship. You can put your lifestyle. You can put your kids. You can put your hobbies. Whatever you're actually leaning on, whatever you're actually living on, that's your foundation. And we would say, if you decide that foundation is actually the person and work of Christ and the Holy Spirit, that's a reliable foundation. But we have to decide that. We have to actually practice that and live that, lest we start building on something that turns out not to be load-bearing. Load mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's foundational. Yeah. Uh, so then we're going to put walls on the foundation, because uh, we're building this house and this life together. Um, Walls do two important things. Walls keep certain things out um, that if they get in could become very overwhelming and toxic to us. 
But they also have space. They have doors and windows that we actually want to bring people in. So what do we want to say about walls? What would you say about those things? Well, I think one of the things you, you realize as soon as you go, yes, we agree on this. This is an agreement thing, right? That you go, yes, we want this. But as soon as you get inside of relationship, you realize there are places that you go, oh, I don't want to go there. I prefer not to. That's not my favorite. There's no fly zones or there's places where we go, wow, there's some places that we um, realize that there are things that have flowed into us that maybe are not for us because of our personality, because of our family history, because of where we've come from, because of our own choices. But there's places, right, that we have had things come into our life that you go, those probably shouldn't be in our marriage, in our life. But there's these things that you go, wow, as we build this foundation together, pretty quickly we realize there's some things that are from maybe our history that you go, we don't want to have those as part of our history. Yeah. A lot of times when we see marriages that have never seen a marriage that has stayed together, they go, we're our first one. So we don't even know what it looks like. Yeah. So even the picture of that and what that would look like to have a commitment over time is a new concept, right? Yeah. But there's definitely things where you go, the Bible's clear about that you leave things behind in order to be available for the new thing that God's going to create inside of your marriage. Yeah. There's a leaving behind, which means you go, oh, there are things that we're supposed to have walled off in order to be available for this new thing that God's creating. Yeah. Um, John Gottman is a, uh, a researcher, author up in um, the Seattle area. He spent the last 20 plus years kind of studying marriage like what happens in marriage, what it's all about. Um, and uh, he's kind of come up with a little bit of a framework. Uh, he's not an active believer himself, but I think a lot of what he's looked at and has been able to capture can be helpful to us. Um, he started a thing called the Love Lab where he would invite couples to come in and he would give them a topic to talk about where they had a little bit of energy for 15 minutes. He filmed them. And then after he filmed them, him and his students would go through sort of, uh, you know, section by section to look at how they were talking to each other. And there were four things that he identified um, that if in that 15 minutes they saw those, one of those four things, they started following couples. And there were four things that correlated with about 95% of the couples who ended up getting divorced. He calls those the four horsemen of the apocalypse, <clears throat> right? And he goes, here's the deal. If it shows up in a 15-minute exchange, it's probably showing up all day. And if it shows up all day, it probably shows up every week. And if it shows up every week, every month, and every year, <clears throat> and bit by bit, bite by bite, gouge by gouge, four things that will sort of suck the life out of your life together. And so here's the four horsemen he came up with. Uh, number one was a critical attitude, right? Uh, just a critical attitude. Sort of like someone does something, you go, really? Did you think that was a good idea? Did you think putting the garbage right here in the living room is a good idea? Uh, I mean, right, but just a critical kind of attitude. And if there's a critical attitude style that's flowing through your life together, just know Bit by bit, it's sucking out some of the life-giving. Number two was uh, a contempt or dismissive attitude. Uh, this might be an eye roll, like, really? Seriously? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's a little bit of going, I can't believe that matters. I can't believe that affects you. That's ridiculous. I thought you were an adult. Whatever it is, but it's a kind of a contempt and a dismissiveness. Number three is a pattern of defensiveness. When someone gives you feedback, when someone kind of lets you know, hey, that didn't work so well, that wasn't really good for me, and the first thing that pops up, shields up, off you go, well, I only did that because you did that. So defensiveness is number three. And the fourth is kind of stonewalling or withdrawing, like going, yeah, whatever, I'm out. <clears throat> Talk to the hand, Right? So those four things, and here's what he would say. If he went home and filmed you tonight in a 15-minute exchange, and these things are cycling through, um, 
these are out, these are, this is relational cancer, right? This replicates, this undermines, this separates. Um, and over time, it has this real undermining sort of effect. And Gottman is very good at defining what separates us. He doesn't necessarily have an instant kind of uh, <coughs> cure or something that would actually um, uh, be life-giving, but he can definitely diagnose what will tear you apart, which is a little bit easier than what will hold you together. Right, which is, these we would say are the things you wanna keep out, right? These are the ones that you go, hey, if these are starting to seep into our house, then you go, those are the ones that we don't wanna participate in. But we believe the scripture has a provision that's different than that. In Ephesians 4, 30, right before he's going into all the things about relationship, right? Marriage. The whole book in marriage. marriage. Um, Ephesians 4, 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. And here's what he's saying that's different than those things, right? Be kind and compassionate to one this? another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the, the opposite of those things would be instead of a critical attitude, you would have kindness. That's what that's saying that's available to us instead of a critical attitude. And instead of contempt, we have compassion. That's available to us through Christ. And instead of defensiveness, we have forgiveness. And instead of stonewalling or withdrawing from your relationship, we have this engagement. Because at the end of that passage, it says, I think it's really interesting, it says, as dearly loved children, that we follow his example because love is getting into the places where maybe we come from a family history that does one of those and it's an automatic like pop out of us response. And when we get into our marriage, into the place inside of our house, we go, wow, I didn't even know that was in me. But it's just popping out as soon as I feel scared or insecure or jealous Whatever the thing is, and that pops out of you, go, wow, there's this other way in which the Lord goes. That's because these things we want to keep out, and the windows and the doors are, we want to let these in. But we have to recognize the places that we're participating with those. Yeah. So when we can recognize this, then we can go, well, what's available instead of that? Yeah. Kindness, compassion, forgiveness, engagement. And we do it always with the backdrop of as Christ has done that for you. Yeah. As Christ has done that for me, I'm aware that then I have it, I have the fullness of that available to me for someone else. Yeah. <clears throat> Paul always talks about marriage as a mini church. In this passage in Ephesians 5, he talks about Christ. Uh, in the church, and then he talks about marriage back and forth. And so our marriage is this mini union animated by Christ. Yeah. Uh, when we, a bunch of us that are married get together, we call that a church, which is again, all of us collectively yielding to Christ and receiving and relieving, uh, releasing love to one another. But we are called to participate. Um, we are called to kind of be receiving it. And when Paul talks about there's some certain things in our own growth and restoration, there are things that we want to put off mm -hmm. that we go, we don't want to do that anymore. And there's some things we want to pick up, right? And so our restoration and our maturation is, hey, I'm going to put that off. These are some old habits. These are some old tendencies. These are some old patterns that are not life-giving. And I have to make a decision by God's grace to go, I don't want to pick that up. Actually, I want to pick up this, 
But putting things off, keeping them out is one part of our development. Mm -hmm. And then picking something else up that's really more life-giving, yeah. right? One of the things we would suggest is, it's always better if you could name it instead of naming it in your spouse. <laughs> because if you go, hey, I noticed tonight that they said, you know, not to be defensive, and that's what you are. <laughs> Usually that doesn't work. So, because Fine. normally we're defensive about our defensiveness, right? It's better if we can recognize these things in and of ourselves. And then we go, wow, I think that I realize that I carry around a spirit of criticism. And I think I get that from some place that doesn't benefit me. And I think I bring it straight into this relationship. Yeah. But if you can name it, if you can recognize it, if you can say it, it actually has a different posture in place to receive these other things. It's best if you can name this first to understand, wow, there's something else, like what Don was saying, there's something else I want to do. Instead of this, I want to do this. Lord, can you show me how to be kind if I'm critical? Yeah. What's kindness look like for me to be kind right now? One time I was hiking, I was talking to Lord about Don. Sometimes we have conversations, God and I, about Don. And so I had a conversation with I'm not God. there, so I can't <laughs> say anything. So. And I was talking to him about some of the things that I was concerned about. And the Lord was like, you know, I have direct access to him because he's my son. And in that moment, I was like, wow, there's two things right away. The Lord goes, I have his heart. And I want you to remember he's my son. Those two things. I have access to his heart. And remember, he's my son. So sometimes if we feel like, oh, I need to bring it up in order for them to see it, that may not be the best way. Sometimes inactivity and praying about it and asking the Lord what you're supposed to do about it might be a better route. Yeah, I used to, uh, when I was first doing marriage counseling, I would sometimes come in and I'd give, uh, the couples coming in, I'd give each of them a clipboard, a piece of paper, and I'd go, hey, I just want you to take a few minutes and write down a few things that would make your marriage better. And so I'd give them a few minutes to do that. Um, and then after that, I say, hey, okay, um, I did have one person ask for an extra sheet of paper. They had 22 items on their list. And I go, hey, just before I collect your clipboards, uh, I just a quick question. Is there anything on that list about you? I mean, I, I, the question was, you know, can you write down a few things that would improve your marriage? Is there anything on that list about you? I did that for 10 years. I never had anybody write down anything about themselves, including the person that had 22 items. <laughs> <clears throat> number 18, number 19, right? Um, and here's the thing, I go, look, I, I could collect your clipboards, but here's the deal. If you're primarily showing up to make a case against somebody else, mm -hmm. and you're expecting me to referee it, I don't, I don't know that that's going to lead to any kind of healing or restoration. Um, if there's nothing on the clipboard about us, what we're really saying is, dear God, would you please change them quickly? <laughs> I've, I've talked to you. I've prayed to you. I've talked to my neighbors or my friends. I've told the pastor, what can you do to change them? I mean, I've done all I can. And I think part of this um, reflection mm -hmm. um, that allows us to sort of go, when we're feeling those things of critical and we're feeling kind of contempt, that's such a self-protected place. Yeah. And when you're self-protecting, you'll survive. But if you're, if you're in a protective place, then you can't reflect. Mm -hmm. You can protect, but you cannot reflect if you're protecting. Mm -hmm. you, you also can't connect when you're protecting. Mm -hmm. So we can get stuck in that place of building a case or seeing what's going on or talking to ourselves. But if we're not sort of um, looking at that clipboard and asking ourselves about our own kindness and our own compassion, I think we're going to be in a kind of a cul-de-sac. Yeah. 
So our last thing that we would say on the, the nuts and bolts of relationship is the roof, right? So we talked about the foundation is this oneness. The walls are what we're keeping out. The windows and the doors are what we're letting in. And the roof is the covering. And the covering, we're gonna just make a couple suggestions what the covering is inside of a marriage relationship. The first one is prayer. If we pray for one another, right, there's a deep connection that happens. And there were a lot of years that Don and I talked about prayer before we actually prayed. We had a lot of talking about prayer, but we didn't pray. And we said, what if we reversed that? We started praying instead of talking about it. What if we didn't talk about our problem? What if we just went straight to praying about what's going on and what we're concerned about instead of talking about it? Because prayer is this place of battle and it's this place where the enemy can convince us that whoever we're with or whoever we're around is the enemy. The enemy does good work that way. His native language is lies. So he can convince us that people are the enemy. And when we go to prayer and we ask him to see what we cannot see with spiritual eyes, it changes us to go, how do you see them? What's going on with them? What would you like me to do? Is there any way I can participate in the love and the goodness that you have? And prayer is also this place of discernment. There's a lot of decisions that we have to make along the route, right? About our kids, about moving, about finances, about how we interact with family, all kinds of things, right? When we need discernment and we can't figure out like, it's not super clear, let's just discern with the Lord. Let's put it in front of the Lord and ask him together. Let's discern with him. Yeah, um, I don't think God is going to give one direction to Renee and one direction and different one for me because we're one. So if we can kind of find a place of humility, go, God, what do you want us to do with this? We're going to ask, we're going to pray, we're going to be willing. And if we have two yeses, that means a yes. And you kind of go, if the person we most want to please is Christ more than pleasing ourselves or even our spouse, if we both want to please Christ more than ourselves or even one another, a lot of times we find a union in that, yeah. of what God is, That's oh, you want to join me. Um, yeah. The second part of that generosity, or the second part of that uh, prayer is uh, this generosity. First Peter 4.8 um, says to love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. And probably underneath every roof, it's covering people that live in that, which are broken, incomplete people. And... Uh, to love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. And then it says, offer each other hospitality without grumbling. Um, hospitality, there's this really fun little word that is kind of friendship and hosting. Philoxenos is the Greek word. And philo is like Philadelphia, that friendship love. Um, and uh, xenos or xanax is kind of this hospitality, like welcome. Like, if you were going to an Airbnb and someone was a really great host, they would tend to you. They would, they would pay attention. They would make sure what's going on. And, and Peter's inviting us to be host to one another. Really generous host. And there's something that can heal. That word hospitality, um, one of the Latin translations for hospitality is the word to heal. When we offer generous hospitality to one another, that's a form of healing. To go, tell me what's going on. Tell me what you need. Tell me how it's going. We'll hold space for one another <clears throat> to offer hospitality without grumbling. If you do something generous, and then you go, well, I hope you appreciate it. I, I emptied the dishwasher tonight. <laughs> I, you know, I do that a lot. Once I do this thing in secret that no one knows, if no one sees it, I kind of announce it. <laughs> which I'm sure, pretty sure biblically wipes out any good I did. <laughs> but it's so hard to resist. Well, I took the trash out again. There's your reward right there. <laughs> you took the trash, right? Like offer it without grumbling. Like as a gift before the Lord. Yeah. yeah. Our son, um, Jacob, when he was in high school, worked at Chick-fil-A. And, you know, they teach them the line. You know what it is? Like if you, they ask, you ask for something from a Chick-fil-A, you know what they say back to you? It'd be my pleasure, right? So one time, I, he was it's so automated because he'd been working there for a while. And at one point, I said, Jacob, I need you to pick up your room. And he goes, it'd be my pleasure. And I go, all of our children are going to work at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> There's 
there's like this crazy generosity because they figured out, right? This hospitality without grumbling, you go, wow, I asked you for ketchup and you said it would be my pleasure, right? <laughs> That's crazy, right? But there is this kind of environment of hosting one another. And inside of marriage, you can get everything ready. Like if you're having people over and you go, we're getting the house all ready. We're hosting them. We're really thinking of them. That kind of hosting is actually the kind of hosting that the Lord's asking us to do with one another. Yeah. Offering hospitality without grumbling with each other, receiving, sending, loving on each other. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna transition and just, I'm gonna pray for us and we're gonna do the little panel. Two things I wanna um, say, um, regard, one area that we see a lot is conflict. Um, that's really difficult, and we have a free resource at marriageandgo.com, and if you go to that, you can see there's a free downloadable resource there for you, um, and really, it's just, it walks you through what it looks like if you can't figure out how to get into conflict and through it and on the other side, and you really love each other more, then this would be for you, because conflict's a hard area. And it's something that will be a part of it when we have differences. The other thing is that we're doing a marriage retreat in June, and we'll send you that information June 10th to 12th. We would love for you to get that, save that date on your calendar. It's gonna be at the Wigwam. And we love to host, and we make it a fun weekend. And actually, guys love our weekend. It's true. It's really true. And so if you um, can, you can look it up and see, see some information at donrenee.com, but um, we would love to, for you to consider coming to the retreat June 10th to 12th and being with us in that. Can I pray for us? And then we're gonna make the transition. Thank you, God, for this time. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to build this kind of house that we just talked about, Lord, to know how to keep things out and let things in, have a covering of prayer, have foundation of oneness. In Jesus' name, amen.